So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ann Carpenter, CEO of Braid Theory, and I am thrilled to host and moderate this Blue and Green webinar on workforce development and, um, and jobs and opportunities in the aquaculture sector and beyond. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Patrick Bezzone, Liana Thompson, and Anna Waters, um, three amazing individuals with three incredibly unique uh, companies that each have their own pathway to opportunities in jobs for all of you. So without further ado, uh, let me start with you, Liana. Tell us more about Aquai, about you, and just kind of help us set the stage a bit with the work you're doing. Okay, great. Um, thanks, and for having us and uh, everyone who's here watching this webinar. My name is Liana Thompson. I'm the founder and CEO of Aquai. And I founded the company together with my life partner, Sidney and Peter Kosky, who is 30 years in climate technology and robotics. And what we are doing is merging biomimicry with water risk management. And what that means is we have robotic fish that carry a payload of cameras and sensors that stay in the water 24 seven up to a year, harnessing data that is then sent to a web dashboard for our customers or a BBD company to access. So it's really about using the 3D printed fish-like autonomous underwater vehicles, enabling early detection of environmental issues, G um, GPS location and rapid intervention to protect our water resources, infrastructures and biodiversity. Thank you, um, we're, U we're, we're a U.S. company, just so you know, we're a U.S. company, but we have subsidiaries in Norway, Ireland, and since October in Abu Dhabi in the Arab um, Emirates, United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Great start um, to set the stage. Anna, please uh, talk to us about Blue Nalu. Uh, yes, so Blue Nalu um, is quite novel. Uh, we're doing cell-cultivated seafood. So basically focusing on you know, high quality, delicious protein solutions, um, starting off with taro, uh, so bluefin tuna, and without taking any more than that original fish from the ocean. So basically at a time when you know, seafood demand is, is high, um, looking at alternative solutions is critical. Uh, we can't just keep on pulling fish from the ocean. And so coming up with something different is, uh, is our goal. So basically, you know, we have real fish cells. They came from a tuna. Um, there's other species too that we've worked on, but right now our first product is going to be taro. And so it's, it's really growing those cells up in more of a farmer kind of background as far as the processes that we're using, because we are not actually in a pond, in a lake, in an ocean or any other aqua sort of environment. So it's really focused on cell cultured uh, meats, fish, seafood. Today. So Liano is one of the co-founders. How did you get um, connected in and start your journey with, with Blue Nile? Oh, my journey is quite different. <laughs> so I had no idea about getting into aquaculture. I actually have a background in life sciences and diagnostics and even a little bit of IT in my past. So I have a PhD in infectious diseases, pathobiology, and um, decided that I liked microbiology and ended up um, after my postdoc going into a research reagents company where I learned a lot of different aspects of operations. I loved manufacturing. I loved training new people in manufacturing. And um, over my career, I've jumped around at a few different companies and learned a lot. And they needed someone who knew lots of different areas. So here we are. Okay, <laughs> and it's so a we're really exciting, come... fun place. So great. It's, it's, we're going to yeah. come back on and talk on some of those details. But I just wanted to, again, um, show a little bit already that we're already coming from some different backgrounds. Yep. <laughs> um, Patrick, so Vertical Oceans is one of the newer companies in the group. So um, uh, Aquai was founded around 2014, 
right? And and I'm trying to think with um, Blue Nalu, 2016, like 2018, 2017. It's six or seven okay. years. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm thinking about almost about the same time that Braid Theory started. And and so Patrick, uh, welcome. Tell us about Vertical Oceans and about yourself a bit as well. Sure. Uh, so vertical oceans, it's hard to describe what we are, but let me put in a nutshell. So we're a software company wrapped in a hardware company focused on shrimp aquaculture, basically, where our mission is to really revolutionize seafood production using, well, cutting edge vertical farming techniques. Um, we're, we're based in Singapore, but I, I maybe should go, go into that in a little bit more detail. So what does cutting edge techniques mean. It means bringing together marine science or marine biology, microbiology, bioinformatics, uh, statistics, software, uh, you name it, and, and bringing that uh, all together. And so what, what we've basically created is a, is a bioengineered zero waste recirculating aquaculture system. And we produce essentially in aqua towers, which is the vertical element of, of what we do. But most importantly, we produce shrimp very efficiently that has a fantastic taste and flavor profile. And we do it without discharging any water, without using antibiotics, hormones, chemicals, or anything artificial. And it's basically all driven and self-optimized by a proprietary AI system that we've built. Um, and, and so that, that delivers a, a bunch of opportunities. Um, the efficiency means it can compete with imports which are produced wholly unsustainably. It means that you can produce anywhere in an urban environment, thus taking out food miles, but also meaning that you can uh, deliver fresh to consumer within eight, eight hours. And because our, our production is done in batches, um, we can produce fresh, never frozen shrimp, which is something that you basically can't get in the US. So my path has been very different. I was a founder 30 years ago where I left my homeland in Australia to start a farm in China, uh, as you do. Uh, I then spent about 25 years in financial services uh, in, in corporate investment banking and private equity, albeit specializing in, in food and agribusiness. Spent 13 years on the main subsidiary board of China's largest agribusiness company, which was an amazing learning experience. And it was at that point that I became really clear to me that in order to satisfy the growing needs of the global population, that technology solutions were required across all of food and agribusiness. So that's been my passion for about the last decade or so. So that's Vertical Oceans, a little bit on, on me. Okay, so for this webinar, what I would like to do is focus in two different pathways. One, talk about, I'm sort of at the micro level, talk about jobs and careers and details, but also at the macro level, really start thinking about trends and drivers and what, and um, innovation, uh, barriers to entry, planet changes, um, and what is, um, why the sector is so important. While the term is on aquaculture, I know all of you and, and Liana, you, we mentioned earlier that there's other applications for aquatic technology around water security um, and food security, as well as aquaculture. For this first part, I'm gonna start uh, just a little bit more narrow on aquaculture and ask some macro uh, level questions in terms of what's going on in consumer behavior that is sort of changing and opening up this industry um, that makes these kind the work you're doing to provide the 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 better fish that's not wild cut that caught that's not extractive. What is changing to, to really create more industry demand, which will create jobs? Just talk a little bit about what you're seeing going on in, in food, in aquaculture, in consumer space. I'm Anyone? happy to start. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's, let's maybe start with the with the US. I mean, I think that there's a great 
no, well, there's a great, there's an acronym which I use, I think, which tries to underscore what consumers want. And, and it's FLASH, meaning fresh, local, affordable, sustainable, and healthy. That, that basically covers everything. And uh, local and uh, local and uh, freshness is, there's very much a premium put on that in the US. We really strongly believe that consumers, first and foremost, pay for a great quality product. So they pay for taste, uh, they pay for clean label, and uh, in many respects, convenience. In, in the US in particular, sustainability is a secondary, um, it's a secondary purchasing decision. In other countries, in Europe and, and other locales, uh, sustainability is, is perhaps more front of mind for consumers, but, but in the US, it's, it's more of a, of a hygiene factor. And so that is essentially what, what we are seeing. And I think where the opportunity is for aquaculture companies in the US, noting that if you look at the space that we're in, 90% of product that's consumed in the US is imported. And so it's a, it's a huge market. It's growing at about 8% per year. And the onshoring of production has really only just begun. So that, that would be my, my view on that. And Liana, you know, with the work you were doing in Norway, a lot of it was in, to use your robotics technology for really improving the, the quality of the fish on the farms, right? Um, so how did you see that translating to creating market opportunity for use of your technology? Was there a clear enough correlation that the companies could support implementing and changing their processes to bring a quiet technology on board to, um, to translate that um, to, to show that that work had better quality fish, which then went to the market or was it more related to efficiencies? Tell me more about your experience in Europe with with Aquai. So, okay, so we're if we're talking about Nor Norway in particular, um, Norway is a very advanced culture when it comes to aquaculture. Um, there's a significant amount of digitization that already exists, which you cannot compare to a big chunk of the world that doesn't have a digitization in um, integrated into their aquaculture farms or you know, especially offshore like in Asia. So for us, it was really about how can a, we're a hardware enabled software company, um, but how can we provide the most reliable, uh, affordable uh, technology? And because we're an underwater fish looking underwater, autonomous underwater vehicle, um, as you know, most underwater vehicles that are, are used for the deep pockets of oil and gas or defense. But we wanted to actually bring an affordable fish like a neuro autonomous underwater vehicle to other blue economy industries. Our entry market was in aquaculture. I mean, if we're talking about how do you get your first customers, I have a robot fish that can monitor live fish. I can sell that as a storyteller. So that's exactly what we did. And we played a video to one of the industry um, leaders, Claude, who also supply Whole Foods um, in the US and Michelin chefs and are really world renowned. They're the only uh, BAP certified company in Norway, uh, best aquaculture practices for those watching who don't know what that is. And so they, they, they don't feed fish to speak, to make fish, which I think is a big issue here a lot in the US that you know aquaculture has a really bad rap in the US. Um, because of maybe some previous industry practices um, by other entities, and maybe some videos you might have seen on 60 Minutes or something like that. But there are ways to farm sustainably using insects as feed or help and things like this. So when we went there, it wasn't about, are we so complicated that they, it's adaptable. So on the contrary, is about how can we, yes, boost efficiency, how can we boost production, but how can we do it at a lower price point than the existing models, which are 
as everybody knows, static buoys or static cameras with which to harness the information. We are a mobile platform that swims next to the stock at all times. So if you're looking at a cage like in Norway, that's 120 or 190 meters circumference, you can have your stock on one side, um, on the opposite side of where the static buoys are, but you can have an oxygen drop where the stalker and, and it you know, might not be detected uh, quickly enough for where the static buoys are. So we were really about how can we decrease reactionary time by mm -hmm. giving that information ASAP on your phone or uh, you know, to, the, to the headquarters, to central, that there's an issue. It's really about detecting environmental stresses. It could be a pH, an oxygen drop. It could be the fact that and we have three cameras, they're able to see the fish. And we're also able to integrate into existing dashboards. So you don't have to use our dashboard. You, we can send the data to, an, you know, there are many other companies out there that are doing um, data that are using their own dashboards, but don't have the option to use an autonomous vehicle like ours. So they've asked us if we could just use our hardware and then just tap into their dashboard because that's what they're comfortable with. So we're comfortable with that too. So I think yeah. it's, it gets down to just being affordable, reliable and- um, Right, the so very much really about, to. yeah. So technology tools to improve the efficiency, which is actually then providing a quality product. But again, you're not out there saying that this is because of you know it, it's not about the save the planet um sustainable whatever it's really about providing quality product in efficient manner that does um align with more enlightened views about providing product in a circular sustainable way rather at the end than, of the day that look at the farmers you guys all mentioned it there's demand they don't want right. they need to keep up with the demand we don't have the big right with all the fish in the sea anymore. So they, you need to farm more. They don't want to take shortcuts. So they need to have, right. they need digitization. They need, it's precision aquaculture, much the same that we have precision agriculture. It's no different. Right. And that's the whole thing is if you think about the evolution, if you think about doing an extractive fishing methodology that is equated with, um, you know, we're not hunting bison on the plane anymore either, but yet we still think of fishing as if somehow there's this romance of, you know, the, the, um, you know, as, as, as if fishing can be, you know, the, the lone fisher feeding their family and this, it's, it's a very different view of what, what fishing has to be and sustainably feeding the planet in a way that doesn't um, create more problems than what it solves. So uh, Patrick, if you have a quick response, yes, please. And then I want to get to Anna to talk as well. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll make one very brief point, which is that there is one advantage of, of wild caught, which is generally you have a product with a better taste profile. Part of the reason for that is because of the way that um, most aquaculture is done, particularly in, in pond or recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, but when this is the one thing that we've really focused on in vertical oceans, where we've basically recreated the ocean in a box and we use um, a whole bunch of tools uh, in, 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 to, to, to do that. But essentially, the taste profile of our products is pretty much indistinguishable from wild caught. So back to Liana's point, consumers want something that, that, that tastes really good and they want it, they want it at, a, at a price point. And so there are ways to do that. Now, the, the sustainability uh, portion of that really has to do with building resilience into your business. If you are sustainable, your business is more resilient. If it's resilient, it's lower risk. Lower risk means it's a better business at the end of the day. Good points. And so going back now then to tr taste and staying on the you know, price points and consumer profile, one of the things that's interesting, not just, um, so, you know, we have cellular aquaculture. We also have a number of companies 
that I worked with um, that are having different kinds of plant-based uh, seafood and so on. And one of the things when it comes back to the taste profile is that's interesting to me is you don't necessarily need to produce the same kind of product for the same applications. What you do for a chopped tuna pokey that's covered in soy sauce and teriyaki and chopped onions and so on is very different than what you want for a sushi grade tuna product that is going to stand alone on its own. So I'm finding interesting nuances in the market itself around aligning products with use cases. And this is where I want to tee it up for you, Anna, and what Blue Nalo is about. And talk to me about the, the transition of commu consumer behavior um, and thinking around um, cellular aquaculture, how that relates to the aquaculture, wild caught, plant based, and sort of where you are in the spectrum and how you um, place yourselves. All right. Well, that's kind of a big one. Um, <laughs> I think with with Thank that, um, certainly we're we're positioning ourselves as far as you know being sustainable, but it is something that is tasty, and you know working with food technologists to make sure that we have the right taste in the product so that someone will enjoy it and therefore come back for more. That's always important. So if we look at the sort of sustainability side of things, we're very actively involved in a you know, few initiatives around ESG and corporate social responsibility, things like that. So that's always a focus. I think one of the advantages that we have around taste is the fact that we are culturing these cells. The taste comes from you know, in the real fish out in the wild, it is coming from what's in its water. For us, we are adding in those same food products, those same ingredients to give that taste profile. And there is, you know, a lot of work going on within the company with our food technology group, doing different taste profiles and really making sure they understand what makes the, the, um, the tuna taste as it should for that particular um, market for whatever you know, whether it's going to be sashimi or it's going to be you know whatever it's going to end up being so there's a lot of work done on that now being the operations person kind of new to this i am not an expert on that so you know there's no, only no, a certain amount right. that i know <laughs> well that that's fine i'm not trying to i'm just trying to kind of um so a couple of things that i just want to bring back up again on the macro and then I want to drill down a, about some specific jobs and, and, and workforce is just I'd love to have some a commentary from each of you about what is really going on on a more global level around food security, water security, the why we're doing this that makes all of these businesses that you're involved in a need to have, not a nice to have. Yeah, Anybody maybe, wants to say okay, Yeah, I'll, I'll pitch ahead, in there. So it was interesting. I, I mentioned I spent a, a quite a number of years on the main subsidiary board of the Kofka Group. Our, our uh, mission was to basically provide food security uh, for China. And um, and when you look at the the um, global, when you look at supply chains and how elongated they are and how global they are, that's a very complex picture. Now, since 2016, trade policy has become far more fluid. Sometimes it can change overnight. And that makes long, uh, elongated, complex supply chains even more complex. And we've seen a greater uh, imposition of tariff and non-tariff barriers being, being put up. Um, then you also have the influence of changing exchange rates and monetary policy. So all of that means that that these that global supply chains, which are very prevalent in seafood, are changing. And even countries like the U.S. are now very very focused on food security. And so that I think provide or presents really a really strong case for onshoring uh, certain certain industries. And it's something that you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have really thought about even in countries that 
are somewhat, say, food insecure, maybe in, in certain areas. So there's been a, a very pronounced change. Now, water security is also something that has become more prevalent, particularly with climate change. We're really proud at Vertical Oceans that we have used in a recirculating aquaculture system the same water for 15 months. We had it tested and it exceeded uh, EP. Well, it, it, it conformed and actually exceeded EPA drinking uh, water uh, limits. And so that is the type, when you talk about sustainability and building resilience into your business, that is the, the type of game-changing technology, I think, which will become more valuable over time. And Liana, I'd love to have you chime in right now because this is a <laughs> well, perfect segue to a lot there's of a really great about. white paper. There's a really great white paper that recently came out and um, well, maybe I'll share it. And it says that water security is emerging as the, glo the biggest global, not only investment, but security risk theme. Um, and that it's because everything we do, everything we grow, everything we make, we make requires water. And if you look at the impact of the climate change, about 69% of the changes is expressed through water. The problem is, is that water receives less than 2% of all climate investments. So here we have a scenario that water security, or water, I should call it scarcity, which doesn't mean the lack of water. We should talk about clean water. I mean, how many, if you look at the rivers across the US, I think 70% of them you can't go. Right, look at the, right. what's coming out of London with the, the River Thames, that they're, they're upset because people, if they go swimming, they might die because of the, the, the illnesses that might be contracted from that. So whether you're talking about food security, you gotta go one step deeper because all the food, and I think probably also you know, you need water to make the food. So mm -hmm. we have to really protect our water. And that's the focus that we're putting on and applying. Yes, we got our market entry in aquaculture, but we never saw ourselves as an aquaculture company. We saw ourselves always from the get-go as a water company, and, you know, mitigating the risks around all the things that are hitting us. And now as we go above or beyond the 1.5 um, Celsius, the world's going to need to adapt. It's not about how to prevent, it's about how do we adapt and what adaptation tools are out there as we have more and more floods as we have more and more food risks, as we have more and more bacteria, and most likely the next pandemic coming from a waterborne disease. So that's when we'll, what we talk about when we are addressing water, not food security and water scarcity. Right, and I've you know these statistics that you call out are just getting more dire and you know, water insecurity across the globe, the the percentage of of humans on the planet that are facing water scarcity issues now are crossing the 50% mark. I mean, there it's 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 insane and and a dire situation across the board. And I think that's the other one for those who are listening who are either um, helping out with programs, that are going to help um, in whether it's community colleges or certification programs or university programs or high school programs about careers and pathways is really thinking about these broader issues and what are we trying to solve for, not just does aquaculture seem like a career pathway, right? When you think about what you're trying to fix, what issues we're facing. We don't know all the careers that are going to be coming out. We don't know all the technologies that are going to come online that are going to be addressing these technologies. We don't know how some of these are going to evolve. And this is part of one of the things that I wanted to tee up with you, Anna, with Blue Nalu, is how do you recruit employees when you're, um, let's say, um, you're still designing the boat, not, you know, you're not driving, you know, you're, you're on the loon shot category still, right? Where you're right. still building out something that is not well-defined of what that end 
product is, what the end pathway is. Um, so well, talk to me about that bigger. I think I can tie that in with even your last question to the other two panelists here that you know, our main focus right now is really, you know, we're targeting species that are overfished, high demand, um, can't easily be cultured in a pond, a lake, a small bit of the ocean, you know, tuna are kind of large. Um, so really, you know, we're trying to address something that there is a demand, it's a sustainability issue. And to do this, we're looking at combining really skill sets from other industries that already exist. I mean, we grow cells to, well, make beer. We grow cells to make vaccines. We grow cells to make drug products. You know, we, we grow cells to do all sorts of different things. And how do we tie that into the aquaculture industry? And this is where, you know, Blue Nalu is kind of sort of an intersection of, you know, the aquaculture sustainability as well as pharma and you know, using a lot of the skills, the techniques, you need people with knowledge in all of those areas. And when you look at it from a career perspective, I, I didn't think I was going to go into this field even five years ago. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I love a challenge and this is definitely a fun challenge. Um, but as far as having, to me, it's, it's all a, around transferable skills and what have you learned and how can you apply it? And so if, if we have people that know how to grow cells, we know people that, we have people that know how to run bioreactors. They could come from any kind of industry. They can come from the beer industry. They can come from pharma. They can come from diagnostics, you know? So there really is room for someone from everywhere. As long as you have that focus as a company at the higher up level, where exactly are we going to go? And that's that's kind of what Lunaloo is really doing, is attracting talent from all over. And you bring across a lot of those, you know, about transferable skills you bring up. And as you're bringing up a lot of those, those are positions that can be a variety of lab tech positions, a, a variety right. of skilled, semi-skilled, highly skilled, non-skilled positions along the pathway where oftentimes when you think of a company that is very um, cutting edge in technology, you th too many times I think um, potential employees think, oh, I have to have a PhD. Um, this was a combination of a, a conversation that we had before um, going live. Liana, Patrick, talk to me about what you look for and the kinds of um, potential employees and what, like, beside the job description, what are some things you're looking for in, oh. in these employees? Before, I, before yes. I answer that, I just wanted to point out, since we were talking about fisheries and stats, 20% of the workers in fisheries are women and women hold 90% of the jobs in interactive, indirect activities like fish processing associated with that. So I think it's important to also, you know, look at the population to ask for, answer your question of who we're hiring. Um, what we look for at Apply, we're a very international company. You know, my partner is um, South African Israeli. Um, I myself am a German and American citizen, so our team, I kind of feel like we're a functioning UN, um, I like to say. So it's really important for us that we have people who can look at different perspectives, which comes into handy when you are problem solving. If everyone comes out of the same background, they're going to like most likely address a problem pretty similar. But if you have somebody who's, who's from Pakistan or Bangladesh talking with somebody who's a PhD from the US or um, you know, another entity from Italy, and you put them all together in a room trying to solve a problem, really, I like to call a group of mad hatters. So what we look for when we hire, it's not so much the credentials in terms of what school you went to, but more about what have you done? What have you physically done with your hands? And what have you, you know, what have been your successes? And one of the things we learned in working in Norway um, on the hiring process is something beautiful that one of the, the questions that Norway we get asked a lot from people that we refer to later was, what causes your, your people to become bored? 
So we try to really look for folks that, that, that how, what, what are their needs? It's not just what I need. It's about, I don't want them to be bored. I want them to be excited. I want them to be able to feel the leisure of, you know, hey, I'm a programmer, but I really want to pick up a screwdriver and learn how to put a robot fish together. Or, you know, for us, it's really important to be multitasking. I think in today's world across multiple industries, you have to be not just an expert in one thing, you have to be able to be, you know, uh, able to handle across various channels or, you know, jobs. Everyone in our company has at least four. I'm our marketing and PR team. And in the last two months, we were in CNN, BBC, Yahoo Finance, Nat Geo, Dubai Eye, and the National. And that's just me. And that's while I'm trying to raise money at the same time. So you have to be able to do multiple things at once. And so we look for people who are who are hungry, not necessarily know everything, but are smart, willing to like be a trooper and pull the long nights that we do. We lead by example. And then um, want to feel like it's theirs. I mean, this is for everyone. Yes, we might be the founders, but what we're doing is going to affect everyone in the, on the planet as well. So we want them to feel that pride on what they're doing is actually helping humanity. You bring yeah. up a bunch of points and Patrick chime in here and I'd like to as well after you complete your, your thoughts. Yes, it's a, it, it, really picking up on one of the points Liana made. So firstly, if you look across our three co-founders, um, John, the original founder of Vertical Oceans, has a background in consulting and statistics um, that then went and ran a, an aquaculture company, got a master's in marine biology, uh, and is a pretty deft hand, um, you know, across all of those disciplines. You've got Enzo, our other co-founder. He has, uh, he's an expert, uh, is a PhD in marine biology and bioinformatics. And, and both John and Enzo previously worked at a an intact protein company. Myself, I originally started in the fresh produce industry and then went into banking, uh, financial services, uh, but, and then have a background in you know, corporate finance and uh, corporate governance. So they're really disparate skill sets. Now, the important thing, and I guess, taking it up a level. So what we look for, not only individuals that have many skill sets, that, that, but that can work as a team, that can work cross-functionally, that are curious, have a good work ethic, and can work across geographies. Now, this is a really important point. If you take, so we are in Singapore at the moment, but looking squarely at market development in the US. And in some respects, Singapore and the US are very, very different countries. One has an extremely high uh, tolerance, uh, particularly when you look at Silicon Valley for uh, uncertainty, whereas Singapore extremely, um, uncertain, extremely high in terms of uncertainty avoidance. One thing, the US is very individualistic, Whereas Singapore, the, the mindset is, is thinking about the collective. And bridging those cultural gaps can, can be, you know, it's, it's, it, it takes some doing. So okay. it, that inform, it's a, if you wrap that up, so you need, I think we look for people that, ha that have, uh, that, you know, want to you know, share in our mission, uh, want to work hard in doing it, have a passion in doing it, and have the skills that can apply it. Uh, to that, but you need to be able to be uh, not only an individual contributor, but to contribute to the, the the whole team and the mission as well. And I, you know, I would like to add to that, having just given a keynote to speech um, at uh, InnoFest in Singapore, working with ports around the world, did a lot of what we do. Our company, we run accelerator and incubator, growth stage incubator and landing pad programs for companies across all the areas of sustainable blue, blue economy, which includes aquaculture as well as shipping and ports, maritime sector, coastal resilience, marine renewable energy. And what serves our team really well is well first of all yes the curiosity we don't pretend to be experts in all this way but we're uh, um 
an inch deep and mile wide in our interests across industry disciplines, across geographies, across um, skill set, and that ability to, you don't need to know deeply everything about blue bonds, but you have to be uh, very cognizant about understanding the chan the changing landscapes around investment in blue economy. You don't have to be an expert in all of these things, but you do have to have a curiosity and an interest and an understanding some of the interplay between different disciplines to be able to contribute, right? Um, so as I'm thinking about this, because I'm already also, and like many of us here, we're all coming at this with a varied and long career. So let's step back a little bit to the audience who is just starting, right? To those who are helping community colleges. Like where, do, where do we start, right? You're just, um, you know, somebody is telling you, great, there's this new certificate program in aquaculture. You should apply. It's a virgin area. You get your certificate. You come out. And there are no LinkedIn and, you know, um, uh, the, all the job boards. Nobody has a job posting for aquaculture. So how do you start? Like, what do you do with this? Where, where, where do we start? Anybody? I'll, I'll pick the Anna. on that one if you don't mind. Um, so having worked with workforce development here in San Diego for many years in the biotech industry, I think it's very similar. I mean, biotech is something that it seems like it's been here forever, but it really hasn't. And there's usually a preconceived idea. And it's like biotech is for, you know, research people and biotech is for people who are really innovative. It is, but there's also that need for building a workforce that also understands reproducibility. And for entry level positions, manufacturing is something that is very underestimated and um, discounted, really. And I've always been an advocate for manufacturing. I think that this industry, like biotech, it is growing and you have to be adaptable. We have to you know, change when we need to. But also, if we're going to be selling a reproducible product, we need to be consistent. We need to ensure reproducibility. We need to have documentation. We need to have people that want to learn a bunch of skill sets that can be transferable into other industries, whether it's biotech to aquaculture, you know, Blue Nalu to biotech. You know, those, those skills that they learn around operations and in biotech or aquaculture, you know, life sciences, research reagents, they're all transferable skills. And really getting that word out to the you know, community colleges, the entry level folks, I think is important that you need to understand where your passion is and that you may not go right there, but what is at least something that can get you in that direction and understanding what you enjoy, what drives you. I mean, if, if you love reproducibility around sort of documentation and making sure everything you know, T is crossed and I is dotted, then maybe it's quality within an organization such as this. But if it's that you want to really be doing different experiments all the time, well, then it's more the R&D track. If you want to be making a product and you are proud of putting out a quality product, manufacturing is the place for you. So I think really understanding what those opportunities are for the entry level folks is important. I mean, I've hired people that didn't have much lab experience, but ran the coffee shop. Like, great inventory. And then she learned the science. You know, it's, it's right. how do you get people in? Yeah. Play to skill, oh. uh, play to strengths at yes. whatever level they are. Patrick. Yeah, definitely. And thanks, Anne, for just suggesting we're perhaps a, a little old. I'm kidding. So look, there's a really yeah. simple but effective framework which is work at the intersection of what you love, what you're passionate about, and what the market values, essentially. Now, um, to Anna's point, it's less these days about traditional academic routes and putting square pegs in square holes. 
because of everything that we've spoken about on the call today, the need, the need to be multi-skilled, the, the need to be able to apply those skill sets in different areas. I, I love the, um, and your description of an inch deep and, and a mile wide, you know, in some respects, you don't need to be a special, I don't like the word expert, but a specialist in everything, but you need to know enough to be able to lead a project or guide, or, or at least have it in your consciousness. So I think a few bits of advice from my standpoint. Firstly, uh, pick your strong, and I think, Anna, this was part of what you were saying, pick your strong suit, pick what you're good at as the entry point. If you look at vertical oceans, that could be on the science side, it could be on the data side, it, commercial, pick one of them. Then start building your skills around that. So you use that as the thin end of the wedge, then start building your skills around that. And then I think you know, and to your question is the the link, you look at LinkedIn and the job profile is not there. You know, in many cases, it won't be. And in many cases, organizations may not have an outstanding role, but they may meet an outstanding person and think, we don't know exactly where the bus is going, but this is someone that we want on, on the bus. And so, the dreaded N-word, networking, is very important. But the final thing I would say is when you, when you network, it needs to be done in a particular way. So you need to build those networks over time. You need to invest in the relationship and try not to be too transactional. And I think if you do, you know, for those looking to embark on a career in this space where I, I, I tell you, there's so much ambiguity as to where aquaculture is going to be in 10 years time but i can tell you it's going to be much bigger much more sophisticated and there's going to be huge opportunities start building the network start thinking about what your entry point is is going to be and crafting a narrative about yourself and and what it, what you can deliver to a whole bunch of the innovative companies that we've we've seen here today your point is well taken also when I find even, you know, like with our own hiring, which we're doing quite a bit these days, is exactly that is I find myself through a lot of networking and it's also students. It's not just high level um, professional networking but when I see students come up in an open house and also see open house and they're asking us, asking questions and they're curious and they're talking about some job that they have that might have nothing to do with it, but we're listening. Ooh. We're listening going, I don't know where to put that person yet, but I know there's some there there. And we're actively trying to be careful on how we create job descriptions to allow some open-endedness to invite more. And one of the things, Lihana, I wanted to actually bring up with you about, you know, women in the workforce and in hiring for positions, statistically, we see um, there's been, I, I can't quote a specific study, but I've been recently reading more and more about this about who applies for jobs and that uh, historically um, males of the species will apply for a job with less of I tick the boxes for these skills on the resume and females of the population will match do I have those skills and if they miss some they won't apply and I just want to say is like how do you how, when you're looking at hiring, Liana, how do you invite or how do you look for entry levels? How do you bring people in? How do you capture this diverse workforce? Uh, just talk to me about how, how your process is working to, to invite what you want to bring to the table. Okay. Let's see if I can remember. Big questions. I know. I, I ran. <laughs> no, no, I want to. And then I, wanna, I come back to an open question. So I want to come. I want to comment on, you know, people who are looking for work right now briefly, and then I'll tell you my processes. 
Um, I think there's a real issue in our society, especially if we're talking about entry level jobs, young people, as you mentioned, there's mostly young people in this call. I think there's a hopelessness. Um, and I think that that's uh, something that we need to address first, that you don't necessarily need to know what your passion is right now, because most people who are young don't. Most people are not feeling um, reju you know, like when maybe when we entered the workforce, there was so much to look forward to. And I don't think that's the ambiance in the youth of today. I think they're feeling hopeless. I think they're feeling discouraged. I think that they're feeling that they don't have um, all the options anymore with lack of jobs. I mean, I was reading something today that the majority of, you know, fast food workers in our teenage years were teenagers. Now they're 40 year old people. So it's, it's really about understanding as a young person. And I say this as a, a mother of two kids who just are adults, young adults who just graduated from college and went into college and are looking for work. Where do you want to be in five years? And then taking an engineering approach rather is reverse engineer that where you want to be and what are some steps that could get you into that place and whether that's you know a, a certain company then yeah see if you can you know start out as a, a, a as a someone who's answering the phone or a PA or whatever the case is um, or whether it's actually a position um, be the you know try to get in the door somehow through internships um, just to get a sense of for two reasons. One, it's great to develop relationships and networking. It is crucial, as everybody already pointed out, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but it's also for yourself to understand, mm, I thought I was into this, but now that I've seen it really from the inside, maybe I'm more into that. So I, I just want to into me, I just want to point that out for the young people that it's okay if you don't know things always get better <laughs> and just look about yourself and where you want to be and start to think, what are some steps, you know, and, and write the steps down so you actually can see it, visualize it. Um, and our process is, you know, we are fortunate because we have a very, you know, frontier, you know, talk about moonshot, you know, company doing very, very difficult, complex, but yet exciting, um, tasks and technology using these technologies of biomedical. So we have a lot of inbound people who really want to work with us. Um, we're also, you know, pretty much we have a few really great investors, but unlike most Silicon Valley companies who raise, or even Southern California companies or Singaporean companies, we haven't raised the millions and millions of dollars. So um, a lot of the people who work for us are very, very skilled at what they do, whether they're putting stuff on the NASA or Mars rover or, you know, doctorates in, in, in their specialties or or starting out. But they, they're doing it not just for the paycheck. They're doing it because it's exciting. Like I pointed out before, they want to be a part of it. We spend a, do get a lot of inbound from the, you know, press that we get. We get a lot of inbound um, Clearly, if you have some things, um, you have to be in office, can't be remote. And our office is not just one location. We have, you know, you have to be able to travel. It's a big part of what that core group does. Um, and just, we we look for people who are, are come across, even if we don't, as you pointed out, and even if we don't have that exact position, clearly, you know, the positions that we need filled, like, you know, like an engineer, at least you have to have the skill set. But there are many positions that we look and say, okay, this is a junior person, but he seems really eager and a quick learner. So we'll hire him even before the senior position. So right. that's a, a lot of the times that we do um, in the capacity that we have, because we don't pay the huge amounts of salary that, you know, funded companies do. I think but that, that has allowed us, we've been able to be very capital efficient, which I think makes your team better at their, their job because they have to really kind of problem solve and be, be creative in that. I think that's a theme that goes across many early stage companies, right? Is you are likely to not have the same kind of paycheck opportunities, but you 
also are making more of an impact in a small company and you're getting a more diverse set of skills um, because you have to, you, you know, um, if I, as a CEO say, you know, pick up a broom, I'm also the one picking up a broom. If we're, you know, checking, writing a grant, we're all involved in writing a grant. If we're doing, you know, so you find yourself getting cross-trained. You made a comment, Liana, I want to say about internships is I love the idea of the internship opportunities are to try things. And it's also to find out what doesn't work for you. So jump into internships. And if it's not a right fit, you learned as well. That is also part of your journey. We have just a few more minutes. I want to ask each of you to say, to give a few points on what would be your advice for those in the audience who are responsible for building out these programs, these workforce development programs, whether they're community college certificate programs or community programs, what would you say to them that you wish they would incorporate into the programs to help you? and help build thoughts. I, I'll, I'll start there. <laughs> I'll start there. Um, look, you, you need a, a, a lot of different skill sets, as, as we said before, but I think there is one skill set I think everyone needs from, it, it, actually, I, I won't be specific, but everyone needs, which is I, you need the foundation of business and how business is done. And so I think financial acumen for anyone working in a startup is really, really important. And <laughs> Liana's smiling. Um, and the reason and the reason is, is, is that that's, um, you know, there is, there is mission, there is passion, there is purpose. But for all of us, we need to build businesses that are both environmentally, socially, and, and sustainable from a government and from a governance perspective as well, but they also need to be financially sustainable if you're going to be in it for the long term. So my ask is some financial acumen uh, is, is required. Excellent. Just, Anna, your parting gifts. Oh, okay. Um, I just, yeah, I okay. just want to Go comment ahead. on that because um, you pointed out to me, I'm laughing because you're absolutely right. You do need to know how to read a, a, a but I, um, financial modeling. But at the same time, I like the Richard Branson approach, which is surround myself with all those who know that much more than I do, um, says the CFO. Uh, <laughs> so that um, my little, you know, thinking I know too much when I don't can be more scary than hiring a great CFO who knows more than the entrusted. But yes, some, some level of a financial acumen is necessary. Yeah. Okay, and Anna. I think for me is um, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, other industries have already been through this. Again, biotech. We spend a lot of time with um, on the advisory boards of what do the community colleges need to offer and not just people sitting around in the community college saying this is what we think we need to offer. It is really getting information from the people that are in the business. So getting input from different functions, you know, from finance operations, R&D, you know, all of those, because none of these companies run with just someone with just a good idea. It takes that multidiscipline skill set and really deciding what is the priority for this company at this time, a lot of intersection within the different industries. So it's been done before, don't reinvent the wheel. And Liana, do you want to bring us on with a, a last comment? A last moment about comment. Comment on which topic? On um, advice for the educators for those who are supporting workforce development programs. Hmm. Um, I would say look at new methodologies. I think a lot of people who are in the education field or setting systems down, they kind of come a little bit relaxed in what they're doing, thinking they already know the path. And we're in a whole different world. So I would say to those people that they really should maybe rip up what they think they know and look and see how, how people are learning today, how people are training today, what is needed for tomorrow and really, um, think about new, new methodologies. And the example is manufacturing. 
I mean, the amount of people, especially investors who say, well, what about manufacturing? Well, have you looked at manufacturing lately? Agile manufacturing, Formula One, everything's 3D printed, okay? <laughs> so some of the old models don't work anymore. So look at the models you have and see if they're still applicable and if they can actually uh, achieve the goal that you have set for yourselves. So thank you all. This is, I mean, this is my favorite part of running, of, of moderating these panels is I learn as much. I appreciate the conversation. I hope the audience appreciate it as well. All to see um, as an organization does so much to try to support the ecosystem. So I hope we help to bring in um, information and um, thoughts for all the attendees today. And I'm thankful to Altasi for allowing us to um, share an hour with all of you to um, impart our experience and knowledge. And so with that, I'll say um, adieu and to the next time. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Sure. All right, bye. And.